from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, good afternoon. I'm John Cole. On behalf of the Library of Congress, I'd like to welcome you to the Sunday version of the 2013 National Book Festival. We know you will have a wonderful day celebrating the joy of reading here on the National Mall. The Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, which I head, promotes books, reading, literacy, and libraries. Today, we are together standing up for literacy by presenting three well-thought-out, uh, well-deserved sets of awards. First, we are going to announce the winners of the first ever Library of Congress Literacy Awards, underwritten by our distinguished benefactor, David M. Rubenstein, who is with us on the stage. Next, Fred Bowen, also on the stage, Kids Post writer for the Washington Post, will read the names of the runners-up and winners of the A Book That Shaped Me contest for fifth and sixth graders in six mid-Atlantic states. Fred will assist along with Lola Pine of the Library of Congress, also on the stage, who oversaw the contest. Then the grand prize winners will receive their awards from Mr. Rubenstein and read their essays from the podium. To conclude, we will hear the winning essay from the District of Columbia winner of the National Letters About Literature contest, which has been administered by the Center for the Book for more than 20 years it's a contest in which students write a letter to an author they feel has shaped their lives. 50,000 students entered that contest this past year. And now, please welcome the Librarian of Congress, Dr. James H. Billington. Thank you very much, and good morning to all of you. It's great to see you a gathering so early in the morning in the name of literacy. You brought the sun out. We had a little rain yesterday, but it's all sunshine today. And it's my great pleasure. Well, at first, a great pleasure, first of all, to point out that lifelong learning is now the overarching theme of the Library of Congress's service to the American people for the next couple of years, and then and beyond that. This process has to begin with reading. Uh, when the time when we are able to let an author tell us something about a time and place other than those from which we are brought up and can call our own. Um, if this happens through the magic of the printed page and learning to read in turn helps us to reach out to others through writing and we'll all enjoy listening today to young winners of the prize essay uh, that they have written about books that they have, in fact, read. Reading and writing go together, and it's my great pleasure to salute and introduce the co-chairman and principal benefactor of the National Book Festival, David M. Rubenstein. He has made it possible, his great generosity, to, for us to reach out all over America and the world this year to identify excellent programs promoting literacy. We thank him for this uh, uh, one and three quarter million dollar over five years that will support awarding prizes and gathering best practices in overcoming illiteracy and opening the magic road to learning. Mr. Rubenstein has also pledged, as you may have heard, another five million over five years to support the National Book Festival. That makes 10.3 million dollars <laughs> since we are, we are deeply grateful for one whose generosity is matched by his own personal passion for books and reading. Ladies and gentlemen, David M. Rubinson. So, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Billington, and thank you very much, uh, John, for what you've done for the book uh, world. Um, that the, the literacy awards really have this genesis. Uh, Dr. Billington and I were talking about what it is that the Library of Congress has done in recent years to further promote the reading of books and literacy. Obviously, the National Book Festival, now in its 13th year, has done a great job. 
toward promoting the reading of books, and so many other programs at the Library of Congress promote literacy, but there really was no national award sponsored by the Library of Congress which would really promote and reward people and recognize achievements in the world of literacy. So what we decided to do was to start a literacy uh, set of awards that we would an uh, grant annually. And it's my pleasure to announce the three winners uh, this year. Uh, the first winner is a, the winner of, for better or worse, the prize is named the David Rubenstein Prize. But despite that, it's actually a very good prize. Um, this is a prize for a lifetime achievement in the world of literacy. And we're very pleased to, to award this to Reach Out and Read of Boston, Massachusetts, and to have uh, the executive director, Anne Maria Fitzgerald. Would she come up? In case you're wondering, the actual prize will be granted um, and at a ceremony we'll have at the Library of Congress in November. We'll have a two-day seminar on literacy and the award winners will actually get their prize then. So let me announce the second uh, winner. Uh, that is the American Prize. Uh, and that is for someone or a group that has done something in the last decade to promote um, literacy, either dealing with uh, illiteracy or illiteracy. And the winner is 826 National, um, which is represented by its CEO, Gerald Richards. And because literacy is not just an American issue, we have an international prize as well. And we're very pleased that the international award winner is Planet Reed of Pondicherry, India. And it's represented by Dr. Robert Lynch, who's a professor of economics at the Washington College at Chestertown, Maryland. So uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Fred Bowen of the Washington Post Kids Post, who's going to talk about the essay contest. Fred? Hello, my name's uh, Fred Bowen, and I write kids' sports books that combine sports fiction and sports history. But as I look out on the crowd, I was also the, uh, one of the judges in the contest and I see that I have a lot of competition out there. There are a lot of wonderful uh, young writers, and I guess I better uh, get a little bit better because I can hear you guys coming. But uh, the whole idea, that, well, this is the second year of the contest, and it's been overseen by Lola Pine of the Library of Congress. Lola, will you please stand and uh, be recognized? And we asked rising fifth and sixth graders from the District of Columbia, Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia to write a one-page essay about a book that they felt had shaped their lives. They had to write the essay themselves. They had to bring it to the li uh, public library and enter the contest. And the contest was judged uh, by a panel of five judges. And let's see, I'm not sure if they're all here, but if uh, they could please stand when I call their name. Maria Salvador, Rachel Walker, Karen Jaffe, and Rebecca Newland. Now we got more than 300 e entries, and today, uh, we bring you the 30 finalists and state winners and our three grand prize winners who will read their winning essays from the stage. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the names of the finalists by state and Lola Pine will hand them their certificates as they come onto the stage. 
Now, I uh, apologize uh, beforehand if I mispronounce anyone's name. I have been in, in, introduced as Fred Bowen, Fred Bauer, Fred Brown, but it didn't keep me from writing things. So I hope I uh, don't make any mistakes here. Uh, first, the District of Columbia, through its uh, DC Public Library branches, a new Hansa Desai of Palisades Library. Grace Dodd of Southeast Library. And Dr. Billing would like to say something. Just let me say a word that uh, Grace uh, is the first person ever to be a finalist in two of our contests. So uh, she is the daughter of many of you know, Senator Chris uh, Dodd and Jackie Dodd. So I wonder if they might also stand up and be recognized for such a remarkable bit of parenthood. Very good. Eleanor Holt of Southwest Library. <laughs> to Kayla Keys of Capitol View Li Library. <laughs> who appears to have brought a fan club. All right, next we will have Marilyn. What, what, oh, pictures. Next, we'll have lots of pictures. Hmm? I can't hear you. Oh, the state winner. Oh, I am sorry. The district uh, winner was Jessica Holloway of uh, Juanita E. Thornton, Shepherd Park Library. My mistake. Next there. Okay. All right. Now we move on to Maryland. Oh, you want somebody want to be in? Actually, I think you're supposed to come out this way. I think out this way. This way. Okay. Here we go. We're going to go this way. We have to go this way. Somebody will give you a hand to help you down. There you go. Congratulations. Hey, good job. <laughs> All right, now we'll go on to Maryland. Naomi Bartnett, uh, Barnett of Prince George's County Library in Upper Marlboro. <laughs> Madison Moen, Enoch Pratt Free Library. <laughs> Isaiah Alugid, Prince George's County Library, Upper Marlboro. <laughs> Catherine Ying, Troano of Prince George's County Library, Hyattsville. And the Maryland winner, Gabriel Eagle of Enoch Pratt Free Library. A couple of shots. Very good. Congratulations. Now for the state of Virginia, Gabriella Hanford, Fauquier County Public Library. George Layton, Prince William Public Library, Noakesville Neighborhood Library. Elizabeth Sullivan, Prince William Public Library, Bull Run Regional Library. And Abigail Spigner, Spigarelli of Arlington Public Library was not present, but the Virginia winner 
is Sophie Dalton of Arlington Public Library. Got the pictures? I think we can go now. All right. Whoops. We can leave. <laughs> All right. Just out that way. Next is the state of Delaware. Sarah Gessner, Brandywine 100 Library. Rebecca Keo. Brandywine 100 Library. Ryan McRae, Dover Public Library. Nicole Ng, Brandywine 100 Library. And the Delaware winner, Julian Jackson II, Brandywine 100 Library. Now the finalists from Pennsylvania, Jamie Elizabeth Daniels, York County Libraries. Malika D. Paul, Bethlehem Area Public Library. Two finalists from Pennsylvania were not able to make it, Cara Clara Allum of Chester County Library and Tom Broadhurst of Parkland Community Library. The Pennsylvania winner is Victoria Sullivan, Abington Free Library. And last but not least, West Virginia. <laughs> the Mountaineers, all right. Cheyenne Hitchcock, Martinsburg, Berkeley County Public Library. Finian Mungovan, Martinsburg, Berkeley County Public Library. Now, two finalists were not able to uh, be here, Addie Hughes and uh, Justin Roberts. And also the West Virginia winner, Shelby Rain Freeman of South Charleston Public Library was not able to be present. So let's give all the finalists and state winners a big hand of applause. And I hope everyone will keep reading and keep writing. Now, uh, Mr. David Rubenstein will present the awards for the grand prize winners. Mr. Rubenstein. I'd like to present the bronze medal as the third place grand prize winner, and that goes to Julian Jackson II. <laughs> All right, right there, read your essay. Stronger Than a Linebacker, a book that shaped me by Julian Jackson. 2013 marks the fourth season that I played football for the Wilmington Titans as a running back. For the past three years, the team has been made up of boys who play football and the girls who are the team cheerleaders. However, 
This year was different because it was the first time a girl played on our football team. Most of us boys did not think it was fair to have a girl on our team. We felt like she wasn't tough enough, she wasn't strong enough, and we felt like she should be a cheerleader or play a girl's sport instead. Football must be your favorite sport because she did work very hard at the practices and she did put forth a lot of effort during the scrimmages. She was also not afraid to get tackled by the team's linebackers. The new girl on our football team was very courageous, just like the character Pravana in the book, The Breadwinner. Pravana is an 11-year-old girl who lives under the Taliban rule and couple with her family. She becomes the family's breadwinner after her father is taken to jail. Under the Taliban, girls have no rights. They cannot go to school or even go outside without a man. Reading about Parvana's story helped me understand a different kind of strength that is different than the kind of strength you need on the football field. In the book, The Breadwinner, the Taliban enforces really harsh rules on the people of Afghanistan. They encourage neighbors to spy on each other, and they also ban all books because they do not want any of the Western world's influence on the Afghan people. The Taliban don't allow any of the Afghan people to make their own choices about what they wear, what they read, or even what they eat. I imagine it's really difficult for families living in a country like Afghanistan. I feel thankful that I live in America and have the freedom to read any book I want to. And I am not forced to spy on my neighbors and I can make my own choices about things I want to wear, read, and eat. In the story, Pravana's gets, father gets arrested and Pravana has to dress up like a boy and earn money in the family to support her family. I feel like that took a lot of courage and also a lot of responsibility for an 11-year-old girl. She had to worry about getting found out by the Taliban every time she leaves her house to earn money. Pravana also does not do normal activities like play video games, go to school, or even play football like the girl on my football team. Instead, she has to be strong in, in the family and become the family's breadwinner. After reading the book, The Breadwinner, I realized how people live in other parts of the world and how different they live from me. I know I would not want to live in a country that wouldn't allow me to make my own choices. I only have a younger brother, but if I had a sister, I would want my sister to be able to go to school and play sports and maybe even play on the football team if she wanted to. What I did learn was that being strong isn't necessarily about having big muscles or great physical strength. I learned that being strong also could be mean being brave. It took, it took bravery and courage for Pravana to dress up like a boy so that she could make money for her family. It also took courage and bravery for the girl on my football team to play with all boys and to me. The kind of courage and bravery will always be more important than great physical strength. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Ask you a question. Let me ask you one or two questions. How long did it take you to write that essay? About one to two months. And when you write it, do you write it in longhand? Do you write it on a typewriter or a computer? How do you do that? Well, first I wrote it on a piece of paper. I got all my ideas out, and then as soon as um, I finished that, I started typing it. And the last question is: If you were playing football, which you do and a girl was coming and you were running, she was running at you and your job was to tackle her in a football game, what would you do? Um, I would try to tackle her, but... But not as hard. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, the silver medal for second place grand prize winner is won by Jessica Holloway, who is from the uh, Juanita 
Thornton's Shepherd Park Library in the district. Okay. Secret Sons, a book that shaped me. The book Jefferson Sons by Kimberly Brew Baker Bradley is about the life of Beverly, Harriet, Maddie, and Easton Hemings. They are the children of a slave named Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. The book follows the life of slaves that live on Thomas Jefferson's plantation called Monticello. Beverly and Maddie narrate most of the book. They tell stories of what life was like on the plantation. They show stories about lives of the slaves, guests of the plantation, things that happen in the great house, in the blacksmith shop, and the le lessons that their mother teaches them. Many of the slaves living at Monticello know that Beverly, Harriet, Maddie, and Easton were Thomas Jefferson's children. Some of the slaves thought they were fortunate because they got better clothes, easier chores, violin lessons, and overseers never bothered them. Yet I learned that there was no good life as a slave no matter who your father was. Jefferson's children had to keep their identity a secret. Although Jefferson was sometimes kind to them, he never treated them as his children. His children watched him embrace and play with his white grandchildren while he treated them as slaves. They worked as servants and lived with the other slaves. Although they were never beaten or sold, they watched people get beaten and their friends sold away, and they knew that their father was the cause of it. In the book, a slave named James Hebert runs away. James was a strong, hardworking slave who worked on the plantation as a nail boy. He, tr he tried to run away with a fake pass. When he met an overseer, he gave him the pass, but the overseer knew it was fake. James was put in jail, taken back to Monticello, and whipped in front of everyone. After watching the whip whipping, Beverly couldn't believe that his father, who gave him the violin and was proud of him for learning to play it, was the same man who ordered James Hubbard to be whipped. Life for Jefferson's sons was very confusing and very hard for them to understand how their father could be so kind to them and cruel to their friends. This book shaped me because I learned that people are complicated and nobody is all good or all bad. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, helped create the United States, and stated that all men were created equal, yet he denied hundreds of people their freedom and made them work as his slaves. History is complicated, and there might be ugly parts of history you don't learn about in school. I, I learned that the Hem I never learned about the Hemings family until I read this book. I now know that it's important to do your own research and go beyond what you read in the school books. This also taught me how important skin color was in the 1800s and how it defined your life. Both Harriet and Beverly left the plantation, pretended to be white, and married white people, and never talked about their past. Even though they left the plantation, I think it was still difficult. They had to lie to everyone they talked to about where they came from and what and everything they've been through. Maddie left the plantation after his mother died, but his skin was too dark to live as a white person. I am glad to live in a time where my future is not controlled by my skin color. I'm free to be, become whoever I want. Okay. So, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. So, how how long did it uh, how long did it take you to write that essay? About a day. A day? Wow. You're a quick writer. Okay. And after reading that book, do you admire Thomas Jefferson more or less than before you read the book? A little bit less because he had these children that were his and he didn't really accept them as his children and he kind of accepted them as his slaves when if he were going to have these children, if he really loved them, he would have accepted them as his real children. Okay. Right. Okay, so now we're going to announce the gold medal winner, the first, prize, pro, first place prize winner uh, of the contest, and that award goes to Sophie Dalton. She uh, entered the contest through the Arlington, Virginia Public Library. Okay. Out of the hundreds of books I've read, there have been books that kept me glued to my seat, 
books that I take out to dinner, and books that lull me to sleep. However, one book that I've read at least 10 times brought me more joy and laughter than any other book. This book showed me that characters can come to life and become like our friend. This book is The Penderwicks by Jean Birdzell, and it inspired me to become a writer. The first time my eyes made contact with the words of this book was when I was six years old. Together, my mother and I took turns gobbling up the words. I laughed and laughed until I could laugh no more. This book had such great characters, especially Jane Penderwick, the third of four sisters who loved to read and write and thought imagination was one of the world's greatest treasures. In the book, Jane is in the process of writing her own novel and gets inspiration from previous books she has read, just like me. It seems like she would be a great friend in real life. I realized that characters in books could become people that we really get to know and care about. After reading the book together, my mom read me a bit about the author. Jean Birdzell knew that she wanted to become a writer when she was eight years old. Then it hit me. That was what I wanted to do when I grew up. I was going to make people laugh and become friends with the characters in my books. The Penderwicks really made an impact on my life. It taught me that imagination and adventure didn't have to involve dragons or wizards. An adventure book just needs a story with twists and turns and a little bit of humor. This book has tons of humor, like when the Penderwick girls and Jeffrey, the boy next door, chase their dog and a rabbit through Jeffrey's snooty mother's garden, ending up in a trampled mess. I really want to bring the comedy of the Penderwicks into my own writing. I honestly think this book made me a better writer as well as reader. It gave me a brand new perspective on how to make people enjoy a story. I wonder how Jean Fritzell figured out she wanted to become a writer. Maybe it was from another book just like the Penderwicks. I hope she knows someday that she inspired a little girl from Arlington, Virginia to start writing. The Penderwicks changed my life because it was the first thing that gave me my passion. I will never stop writing and I owe most of it to one phenomenal book and its equally phenomenal author, Jean Birdzell. Okay, one second. Well, let me ask you a question. So how long, how long did it take you to write that? About two days. Two days, okay, and you want to be a writer? Yes. And you want to write nonfiction or fiction? Mostly fiction. Okay, and do you want to write because you think you can make a lot of money writing or because you just enjoy writing? Because I just enjoy writing. Okay, that's the right answer. Okay. <laughs> okay, all three are going to come up. Can all... Is that right? Okay. How many people enjoyed this? Hey, okay. All right, great. So I want to I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank all the uh, people who participated, all the winners. And now I'm going to turn it over to John Cole. John, thank you. Thank you, thank you David.
The last program we're featuring today is, as I mentioned earlier, Letters About Literature. This long-running program of the Center for the Book uh, asks students in grades four through 12 to write a book, to read a book, and then to write a letter to the author again talking about how this letter shaped, them, shaped their lives. This is a national contest, and I mentioned we had over 50,000 entries this last year. Uh, we have a winner for the, a national winner for the first time from the District of Columbia. But before I introduce her, I do want to ask if Kathy Gourley, who is our national director, happens to be in the audience. Uh, she's not, but I want publicly to recognize Kathy for the wonderful work she's done. Our winner today is Alessandra Selassie. She's going to tell you the story, but I'd also like to have her parents stand up and be recognized. They're here in the front row. Please give them a hand, please. <laughs> Alessandra uh, is the winner in the category covering grades four through six. And one of the reasons I introduced her parents is you will find that the the letter that she is going to read to us is written to Laura Ingalls Wilder, author of the Little House series, and I would urge you to listen for the connection, the wonderful connection that Alessandra made between a book of the past and her present situation and her present wonderful family. Alessandra, please go ahead. Dear Laura Ingalls Wilder, my life could not be more different than your life and the lives of the pioneers that you describe in your series of books. I live in the American capital, Washington, D.C., and enjoy all the things modern life has to offer. I have a safe way around the corner, and I don't have to worry about growing my own food. When I want to go somewhere, I go by car, or if it's far, I go by plane, which gets me there quickly and safely. When I want water, I turn on the tap. When it's dark, I turn on the light. While my life is so different than yours, I was still so touched by your books because they, helped me they, because they helped me to finally understand the life of someone I love, my father. My dad grew up in Eritrea, which is a country in Africa. It was a new country, and he and his family were, were a part of building the nation, just like your family was a part of building America. My dad often jokes that his mom made sure they weren't picky eaters by not giving them much to eat. It's hard, for me it's hard for me to imagine not having enough to eat. If we run out of food, we go to the store. But your book, The Long Winter, really made me understand what it felt like to worry about not having enough. I saw in the way Pa and Ma worried about feeding their, si feeding their children how hard it must have been for my grandma and grandpa with their six children. My father also talks about meeting his friends at night to study under the light of one of the few street lamps in the town. You studied with the light of an oil lamp, and Pa and Ma worried about having enough money to buy oil for the lamp. When I read about your dolls made out of scraps of fabric, it made me think about my dad's stories of making a ball out of a sock filled with old clothing and scraps of fabric. We feel sad today to hear of kids ha having so little, but when you describe your childhood and to hear my dad's stories, I realize what, a good, what good childhoods you both had. You didn't have many toys, but you made up games and created your own fun. Even though my dad grew up in a different place and time than Pioneer America, when I was reading your books, I realized how similar your lives were in terms of the way people interacted. Children had to respect their elders. They didn't talk back like characters on TV do today. Children were expected to do a lot of chores and to help take care of the family house. I have a couple of chores to do, but nothing like what my father had to do. He was the eldest so he had to take care of his younger siblings. His mom didn't hire a babysitter like you would today. The way he played with his siblings and friends wasn't over Wii or playing computer games or talking through Instagram or Facebook or anything with technology. They got together face to face and played with each other, ran around outside and explored nature or told each other stories and jokes. I can see how this would make a stronger relationship than wanting to kill each other on a Wii game. As much as I love technology, it sounds like fun going back to these kinds of relationships. Today, we think people are important because they have money or are famous. In our trail and in pioneer times, it didn't matter how much you had. It wasn't cool to be rude or have a snappy comeback. You didn't lie because your word was very important. 
What mattered was being honorable. In my dad's family, just like in your family, two things were really important, being self-reliant and getting an education. Knowing that you could grow your own food and support your family was important. People didn't have much, but they didn't want handouts. They wanted to work and work hard, just like your pa always did. I thought of my father when I read how Ma helped prepare you, Mary, and Carrie for school, and how excited Ma and Pa were when you moved to a place that had a school. When my dad was five years old, his grandfather took him to register at a school. His family had made sure he learned the alphabet before he went so that the school had to accept him, even though he was younger than the normal age for starting school. I love reading about how you all worked hard to make enough money to send Mary to the special school for the blind that was far away. My dad's parents have worked hard to get him into a good high school that was also far away. This led him to finishing high school in America and then college and graduate school. Today, lots of kids complain about going to school, but you, Mary, and my dad always felt lucky to go. Before reading your books, my dad would tell me stories about his childhood, but I didn't really understand them. My life growing up in America is so different than his life was growing up in Eritrea. Also, he lived in the United States so long that his life today is, like, is almost like any other American. Reading your books and having such a vivid image through a young girl's perspective made me appreciate my dad's childhood and feel closer to him. It also showed me reasons behind many of his rules and is always emphasizing being honorable. This gave me a new way of looking at him and a new type of relationship with him. I know you wrote these books to help children understand the lives of the American pioneers, but for me, it helped me see my father's African childhood as being less foreign. Thank you so much for writing this series. Sincerely, Alessandra Selassie. Thank you, Alessandra. Thank you so much. Now, as we close our program today, I'd like to ask a few folks to stand and be recognized in our audience. First of all, all of our winners and finalists and any students who entered the contest this year, any of our contests, please stand. Stay standing, stay standing. Next, next are judges and the librarians from the public libraries who participated in the contest. Please stand. The teachers and the school officials. Now finally, finally, anyone present, everyone present who believes in the power of books to shape lives. Please stand. Thank you all for standing up for literacy and reading. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks to all of everybody, especially our winners. Have a great festival. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.